morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Brett Strobel. I'm the pastor here at Ashland First United Methodist Church, and we are just tickled pink, even though I'm wearing blue. We are tickled pink that you folks, our guests from uh, First Presbyterian Church, are all here. So welcome, welcome. This is going to be great fun. I'd like to introduce my cohort for today. Uh, cohort, uh, that's not right. A co, a colleague, that's it. Dan Fowler, please stand and wave hello to everybody. Yay. Dan and I got together for coffee, uh, uh, oh, not too long ago, and we were, we were just talking, saying, it would be fun to get our two congregations together in the summertime. And here we are. This is so amazing. So welcome, welcome. I've got um, an announcement that Bobby is going to interpret for me <laughs> uh, with sacred dance. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Waiting for my voice. I, my name is Bobby Kidder, and I am the director of the newly formed drama group, liturgical drama. And the first uh, one that we're going to do is the 23rd of July. It's a six-person show, and we have two openings left. It's a short rehearsal after uh, our, our session today, our, our, our service today, and, and you can follow me to the library, and it's short, and it's sweet, and it's fun. So um, raise your hand if you've already volunteered. Yes, yes, so you see nice people. So <laughs> <laughs> come and see me if you're uh, wanting to be one of the two who adds their name to the list. Thank Terrific. Thank you, Bobby. And... I'm probably forgetting something, but we'll just make it up as we go. Oh, yes, thank you. Our coffee hour is going to be over in Wesley Hall, followed by the SART uh, presentation. So I invite you to join us over there, and you can just follow across there on the sidewalk to the Wesley Hall, or we have an indoor passageway there, too, just down the hall. and follow the noise. <clears throat> so, there we go. Let's stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. Good morning. This is cool, but it's also really weird. <laughs> I'm getting used to the view. This is a beautiful sanctuary. Thank you for uh, inviting us to be with you this morning. Um, I'm excited to be here, and we had originally had talked about the possibility of maybe going out into Lithia Park and doing a service together. But one of the things that Brett pointed out is that both of our congregations may have trouble getting on the grass and getting to where we need to go. So we're glad to be here with you. About four months ago, when did we first? Yeah, about four months ago, I got an email from Ava de Rosier from SART um, asking if maybe she could talk about uh, what they do. And so we had coffee. And um, then I thought it would be great to have what we call in the Presbyterian Church a noisy offering to support their work. And so we're going to be doing a noisy offering. You'll notice, hence, hence the term noisy. However, as they say in O Brother Where Art, their folding money's just fine. Um, but uh, Ava and I talked, and so we originally had planned on having the presentation at the Presbyterian Church, and then when we figured out we're going to do this together, I asked if we could move it here, and she said yes. So we are going to hear from both the executive director of SART, who is Susan Moen, and Ava de Rosier about what they do. And then after that, we'll take our noisy offering. After the service and after some time of fellowship, then there'll be a presentation in Wesley Hall. Uh, that'll be a little more in depth. So, Ava and Susan, the pulpit is yours. Good morning. I'm Susan. I'm the executive director of the Jackson County Sexual Assault Response Team. Hello, Ava DeRosier. So nice to be here with you all. Um, I do uh, some uh, prevention education in schools and within the community. Thanks for having us. 
So Jackson County SART is a nonprofit. We started in 2004. And um, we work with survivors of uh, different kinds of violence, sexual violence, domestic violence. Um, we have acute care, so we run a hospital program for folks who've experienced these types of violence um, for an acute, um, acute care for them. And we also run support groups for survivors, and we have do advocacy. Um, for folks who just need help or maybe are going to do a reporting process or going through the criminal justice process, and they can have confidential advocates with them helping there. And then another thing we offer is a resource specialist whose entire job is to help connect survivors, whether it's from a crime that occurred recently or from a long time ago. We, um, we help connect those survivors to any kind of resources they need, whether it's finding counseling or um, some uh, financial resources, help with housing, things like that. Um, our goal is to um, work with survivors and find out what their needs are, both immediate and long term, and do everything that we can to support them in, in, in getting the help that they need for their healing journey. And then another big part of what we do um, is prevention. So we have a program in the school's kindergarten through 12th grade that um, does age-appropriate violence prevention education. Um, it's very much based on the idea that there's a lot of culture change that needs to happen in order to um, really uh, focus on changing the levels of harm that at the moment are sort of considered acceptable in our society. And when we um, have our, our, our gathering after, uh, after the um, fellowship hour or fellowship time, um, we will talk more in detail just about what does that mean, what does it mean to change a culture um, to help prevent violence so that instead of constantly just responding to folks after they've experienced harm, we're all actively working on creating a society, creating a community that um, puts time and energy into um, supporting prevention efforts as well as response. So for those of you um, that aren't able to, to join us after, a couple of things we'd love to leave you with when we look at what prevention means within our community. There are three things that we want to focus on. One is normalizing consent, creating a culture where even when we want to move into someone else's personal space, we ask for permission. So one small way we can do that is even with the littles in our lives where there's a power imbalance is that we normalize, that we communicate about those things. Another is that when survivors come forward, and that might be someone that you know, it might also be something that you see in the media. Believing survivors will have an incredibly healing impact on the way that we can move toward prevention. And also, knowing local resources. Um, SART provides resources, as Susan said. There are also a lot of really wonderful organizations in our community that help when someone has been impacted by this type of violence. And each of us, individually and collectively, can make small changes, have awareness come where we're able to create some positive change. Um, thank you so much. We hope to have the chance to talk more with you after fellowship, and we so appreciate being here with you. Thank you. From my perspective as a pastor, that's kingdom building, making a society like that. So um, we'll ask our ushers now to go through and uh, make our offering noisy or papery. Thank you very much for giving. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paula Fowler from the Presbyterian Church. And yes, the Presbyterians are used to sitting for this part, so you have to forgive us. <laughs> And what a joy it is to be here all together worshiping as one body. Please join me as we read responsively the call to worship. By your words, O oh Lord, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've I committed, committed myself, myself and, and I'll, I'll never, never turn back from, from living by your righteous, righteous order. order. I got hold of your book on living and I'm never, never letting it go. It's mine forever. What a gift, and how happy it makes me. 
I concentrate on doing exactly what you say. I always have and always will. Wahoo! <laughs> We spent a lot of our energy getting here and greeting one another and just, just making connections, and that's fabulous. Well, now's the time that we focus our energies from getting here to being here. And so I invite you now to close your eyes and breathe deep and imagine your spirit centering itself in this time and in this place. Gracious and holy God, we are so grateful to be here today, to be together, to worship you, to have our hearts and minds opened and challenged. Lord, we ask your spirit to be with us today and help us to make this time of worship really meaningful. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord for which we give thanks. We thank you, O oh God, for your love for us, love that reaches out in grace to accept us wherever we are, whoever we are, love that reassures, affirms, prompts, challenges, and overwhelms us with the completeness of its response. Help us, your people, held within the security of that love to risk showing that same love to others. May our love too, be known for its abundance, its readiness to speak out, and its healing power. We give thanks for our two congregations coming together this morning to worship and praise you. We pray for your blessing upon our churches and ask you to help us create a more diverse and open kingdom. We lift up our healing requests this morning. We pray for healing in mind, in body, and in spirit. God, for all of those who we think of right now, we lift them before you and pray for healing in mind, in body, and in spirit. We lift up our prayers for the world in which we live. We pray that you help us find new ways to be caretakers of your creation, as this past Thursday was the hottest day recorded for this planet. Help us to fight for the beauty of your creation entrusted to our care. We ask you to guide us to people who are forced to flee due to failing crops and climate disaster. We pray for cleaner fuel, for new technology, and for leaders who are willing to embrace new ways of using resources on this fragile planet. We lift up this morning the people of Pakistan who are struggling through severe flooding and more than 50 have died and many are displaced. We ask for war to end, especially we lift up Ukraine this morning. We pray for peace, for leaders to negotiate a fair and just peace. We pray for many who have lost sons and daughters in this war. 
We pray for the unhoused community and for those who work to help them. For the Ashland Emergency Food Bank, Access, Aura, St. Vincent de Paul, Southern Oregon Jobs for Justice, and others. We pray for equitable treatment, livable wages, and affordable housing in the Rogue Valley. We lift up to you that family struggling right now after a cousin was outed to her mother. God, we pray for acceptance. We pray that that person would be seen as a beautiful blessing of your creation. We ask for your blessing upon all United Methodist clergy who are starting in new places. We pray for your blessing upon them and upon their congregations as well. And we give thanks, oh God, for organizations like the Sexual Assault Response Team from Jackson County. We pray that we can work for a world where that's no longer needed, but until then, we pray for those who have been assaulted. We pray for justice, mercy, compassion, and healing. We pray for your justice and that you would help us to work for change and to lift up victims. We pray for the oppressed, for an end to racial hatred, for an inclusive and loving society where all can prosper and share their gifts for the common good. From our neighborhood prayer box, we pray for Tink and her children and for Patty, who is seeking a blessing from you. We ask for your blessing upon the jamboree that will be happening this week and pray for safe travel as members from this congregation head down there to be with other scouts. God, hear us now as we lift our silent and private prayers before you. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who was and is and is to come, and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. High towering mountains, fields gold with grain, rich fertile farmlands, parks on the plain, homes blessed with
I will be uh, reading from uh, the letter to First Church Rome from Paul, starting at chapter 7. I'll start with verse 15. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, let me say that again, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do... (laughs) This almost sounds like an Abbott and Costello routine, doesn't it? (laughs) Now, if I do not do what I want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, we we talked about how are we going to present the sermon. And we first started doing paper, scissors, rock. And that just didn't work because we kept hitting the same one. So... we decided let's have a conversation. And then towards the end of our conversation, as we kind of unpack uh, the scripture and some of the images that sparked our imaginations, we're gonna open it up to you to ask us questions. So, um, oh yeah, so I'm gonna let you go. What do you think of that one from Paul? Well, sure. (coughs) So it was interesting when we talked about this particular passage. Paul, for the most part, uh, the veneer is on. You don't hear a lot about Paul's struggles. You get a lot of Paul's teaching. But this is one example when Paul really struggles. He struggles with the sin that is within him and the, the grace that is there. And it's one of those very few moments where you get kind of Paul being real. Most of the other time, it's just a lot of theology packed into a paragraph. So um, we kind of came up with the idea that there are about three or four spots in this passage that we want to talk about. And the first one is the idea of sin. Uh, The word in Greek for sin is hamartia. And what that basically means is missing the mark. That's the actual translation of the word. And it was first used by Aristotle in 300 and something BC in in one of his collections. Um, Became part of of those who were on stage in Greek tragedies primarily that the the protagonist, the main character, was uh, about to do something that he or she should not do because it will affect everyone else and move the whole play from joy to sorrow. And so that was the first understanding of hamartia, But I think its origins are much further back than that. I think they go back to the real idea of actually archery. And by the way, I I floated this idea behind to Brett, and then I thought better of it. Um, I I do archery at a place called Moombo Archery. And I thought, you know, maybe I could do an archery demonstration and show how to, you know, hit the mark. Because that's the idea. I wasn't willing to hold the apple on my head. I just... (laughs) I thought it would be better not to impale our Methodist friends uh, with that. But but the idea is the same, that, um, you know, the person at Mumbo Archery, his name is Lloyd, he's a wonderful man from Australia, he puts targets in front of us all the time, and they're all different targets. Sometimes they're the very standard uh, white, black, 
yellow, red, uh, round targets. Sometimes they're a, a giant rubber bat flying. Um, we have balloons. We have all kinds of different things. But when Lloyd puts those targets out, his expectation is that we'll hit them. God is the same way. God mm -hmm. gives us a target of love to hit every day. When we hit that target, we, we, we do the things we're supposed to do. We live the way we're supposed to live. When we miss that target, we're more self-centered. We don't rely on love. We don't love others. So that's my explanation of sin, and I'm going to turn it over to Brett and let you talk about it if you want to. And oh, go sure, from there. sure. Um, you know, usually we <clears throat> we think of sin as in like specific little acts that we do, like snitching a cookie or exceeding the speed <clears throat> limit <clears throat> or, you know, you know, something like that, these individual little acts. But Paul is not talking about sin, talking about the hamartia in that way. Paul is talking, it, talking about it as an existential state. It is something that we are always in. And that's um, a part of the human condition. And so he's trying to unpack that and, and his understanding. And I found, it, I found it interesting that earlier um, he talks about Adam, mm -hmm. you know, and the original sin. So we know, and that's in chapter 5 of, of Romans. And we know that he is busy kind of unpacking that. That's what's playing in his mind. And so, do, do you all know the, the, the sin he's talking about of Adam? This is not a trick question. <laughs> eating, eating the apple, or eat, uh, how would you reframe that as the prohibition? That's right. Do not uh, and as a type of disobedience, don't, don't take, eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so we have that one prohibition in, in Genesis. And then the temptation comes. And the temptation, as you know, and the serpent says to Eve, oh, isn't that delicious? Isn't it a lovely fruit? And Eve says, well, that's a no-no. And God says, oh, or, or Satan says, oh, no, 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 no. You know, it, it, is, it is something that uh, if you eat it, it will make you like God, knowing good and bad. Oh, that looks good. And in that moment, a prohibition that was uh, understood as for the benefit of humanity, of humankind, uh, all of a sudden twists. And it becomes something that God is withholding from humanity, a, divine, a part of the divine being that is withheld from humanity. And all of a sudden, God moves from, or the experience moves from divine love to divine rivalry. God now has something that I want. And so Adam covets this. And, and then in chapter 7, or um, a little bit earlier, he talks about covening and how covening or envy turns us into rivals. And in, and in my thinking, um, when I'm talking about sin, it, it you see the, the development from, um, you know, envy to rivalry to animosity mm -hmm. to enmity. And so there, there is a movement from divine love to now becoming enemies. And that is the state that we find ourselves in, caught between both divine love and enmity. And this, and by the way, when I talk about enmity, you know what I'm referring to? Enmity is about my ability 
to be an enemy to another. And that's different from saying, oh, there, I have enemies out there. Rather, it's saying, when am I an enemy to another person? Hmm. And, um, and rivalry feeds into that. We are constantly in this state of rivalry. And, and, and that's what Paul says. He goes, the law is good. It's great. It's brilliant. But even because of this condition, because of this state that I'm in, I turn the good stuff bad. And I don't want to do that. But I end up doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to continue the idea of law and sin, uh, Paul talks about law, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But there's a really interesting thing that happens a chapter before. In chapter 6, Paul says... So now you're dead to sin because you're alive in Christ Jesus. So sin's not a problem. At least that's what it seems like. <laughs> but literally one chapter later, folks, the struggle is real. Yeah. Paul is talking about that back and forth, that idea of, of enmity and, and, and sin and the struggle we have with it. So sometimes uh, the, the Revised Common Lectionary will do chapter 6 of Paul one week, and chapter 7 of Paul the next week. And so I guess we could preach, uh, well, there's no problem with sin uh, for chapter 6, and then the next week says, well, sin's a problem. And, <laughs> and so, so I think it's important to look at what Paul's struggle is, is like with sin. Um, and Paul was very big on Christ crucified, the crucifixion and the, the atonement that comes from that. So for Paul, he believed that we always have access to God, access to grace, because of the atonement. And so that's a big piece for Paul. Um, I know not everyone's comfortable with the atonement and the atoning sacrifice. That's something I struggle <laughs> with, uh, but I hold it in mystery and I still believe it points to grace. And so uh, from my perspective, the idea is that grace is always accessible to us. Therefore, when we are sinning, when we are in enmity with one another, we have that option to always be able to turn things around. And it's always there. Um, the analogy that comes to mind, I had a friend who told me that uh, they were back in, in the south in Mississippi at a habitat build. And one of the women from the Habitat group went into a cafe. She wanted to have a authentic southern breakfast. So she goes into the diner, she sits down, and she orders eggs and ham and uh, toast and a cup of coffee, a little a cup of fruit. <laughs> Don't <Grits>. steal my thunder. <laughs> Don't steal my thunder. <laughs> and so she sits down and orders that and waits, and 10 minutes later, it all comes back, and then there is this big bowl of steaming grits. And she looks at the, the wait staff and says, excuse me, ma'am, I, I didn't order this. And she said to her, honey, in the South, grits just comes. <laughs> grits is like grace. Grace just comes. Yeah. So in that part in chapter 6 when Paul seems to say we don't have any trouble with sin, we do, but grace is always, always there. And that's, that's the illustration I think that if Paul were here today might make, although I'm not sure. Uh, but, but it means that God is always for us. God always loves us. God always cares mm -hmm. for us. And even if we keep missing the target... Like my friend Lloyd from Australia, he would keep putting that target back up, and God says, that's okay. Here's another one. Try so, it again. Try yeah. it again. Try it again. Yeah. Now, we wanted to talk uh, just briefly, you know, because the issue of law comes up a lot, uh, mm -hmm. especially in this passage. But Paul uses the word nomos for law in different ways. And so there are different meanings that are happening in this passage. Um, like religious precepts, we'd say that's one way, Torah, that was translated into the word law. Um, but you also have civil laws, and you have social 
ethnic customs and um, axiological principles or principles of value there, as well as natural dispositions, at, such as saying, um, oh, it's in their nature to do X. And nomos, that one word, is used in those different ways. And we see that uh, happening in Paul's writing. That's why he talks about the law of sin. You know, um, that being the human condition that he's talking about in there. And, um, and so sometimes it's hard to narrow in on when Paul is talking or, or referring to Torah. A spe- and, and I think this has been part of the mistake of theology um, over the centuries, is that we've always assumed, or it's been interpreted, that Paul is writing to Jews. No. <laughs> if you remember, Paul had an agreement that his message was to Gentiles. And Peter and the Jerusalem contingent, their message were to the Jews. And so when you read Paul, you have to put it in your head that Paul is talking to a Gentile audience. And didn't we, when we talked about this part, we were yes. mentioning that uh, Paul got thrown out of so many synagogues. <laughs> After a while, they said, no, 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 you, you stop doing that. We're going to put you with the Gentiles. Now. <laughs> so. It was an act of damage control, yeah. wasn't it? <laughs> and so um, we... St- And I think what that does is that it starts to help us listen to Paul differently. Because if Paul is just talking about Torah and the law, then we can read Paul at a distance because we don't have Torah as a part of our daily life. But if he's talking about something else, customs um, or rituals or values, all of a sudden, our ears need to perk up and saying, how is, how is that directed towards me? And so Paul, <laughs> Paul, uh, like I, I agree, I think this is probably one of the most poignant parts of Paul yeah. when he just says, I try my best and it's not good enough. Yeah, I always mess it up. I think that's so poignant. Because I think every person here can relate to that. And so he's asking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What do we do? Are we in the midst of existential angst? Or is there a liberation that's coming? And Paul sees the liberation in Christ. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. That's great. And, and this, this are actually our being in the pews and worshiping and laughing together and praying together and singing together and all of the togetherness is remarkable because 150 years ago, there was an intense rivalry between Methodists and Presbyterians. <laughs> you know, when, when, when they came over. In, in Oregon City... Um, <laughs> There were were two flour mills. One was owned by a Methodist. The other was owned by a Presbyterian. And um, so the Methodists would take all of their grain to the Methodist one. And then the Presbyterians would take all the grain 10 miles away to the Presbyterian mill. You know, there was just this incredible tension. And you know something? We are now the resolution of that tension into community and love. So everybody, give yourselves a hand. Yeah. And if we have bread that's been made this morning, I'm assuming it was not made by either of those mills. So hopefully we're... No, we ran over it with a car. Okay. So (laughs) All good. We remember... um, the ways that God has blessed us. And the scriptures teach us that we, God blesses us in order to become a blessing to other people. And so in the spirit of recognition of all the blessings that God has heaped upon us 
and in gratitude, we receive an offering to be a blessing to others. Life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer that's brave. We must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave. Watch the curves of fills the tunnels never falls or never quail. Keep your hand upon the Savior, Thou wilt guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in Thy praise forevermore. You will roll up grids of trial, you will cross the bridge of strife. See that Christ is your conductor on this lightning train of life. Always mindful of obstruction, do your duty, never fail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. Blessed Savior, thou wilt guide us till we reach that blissful shore. Look for storms of wind and rain On a fill or curve or trestle They will always ditch your train Put your trust alone in Jesus Never falter, never fail Keep your hand upon the throttle And your eye upon the rail Blessed Savior, Thou will guide us Till we Shore, where the angels wait to join us in thy praise forevermore. When you roll across the trestle, spanning Jordan, swelling tide, you behold the Union Depot into which your train will guide. There you meet the superintendent, God the Father, God the Son. With a hearty, joyous plaudit, weary pilgrim, welcome home. Blessed Savior, Thou wilt guide us till we reach that blissful shore, where the angels wait to join us in Thy praise response. Gracious Lord, in all of our mistakes and misguided intentions, you continue to love us and empower us with grace and mercy to strive for new possibilities. May our desires and choices match your hope for us. Amen. Now I invite you to Turn around and reach out and hold your neighbor's hand. We're trying to make a suggestion of a circle. <clears throat> or a snake or one of those things. And now may the grace, the beauty, the peace, the power, the wonder of Christ be in you and through you. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.